Good evening, everyone. It's a, a real delight uh, to have you with us for this uh, webinar on the topic of Johann Georg Hammann. Um, and uh, uh, a warm welcome also to Dr. John Betts, who is uh, Associate Professor of Systematic Theology at the University of Notre Dame, according uh, to the back of the book he wrote on our topic this evening. So uh, it's this book that um, really inspired me to want to include this in our, um, our webinar series. And I cannot recommend it highly enough. It makes uh, Hammond, who is a difficult uh, thinker, uh, quite accessible. So uh, may I recommend this uh, to you? Um, and let me give you a little bit of background. Um, my doctorate uh, currently is in the field of the, the point of interaction between enlightenment thinking and philosophy and Christian theology at the end of the 18th century. And I've been investigating a series of key thinkers, most of whom you will have uh, come across. And then in the small print in a lecture, I came across this individual I'd never ever heard of called Johann Georg Hammann. And uh, his dates are 1730 to 8, 1788. And I discovered in the process that he is a remarkable Christian thinker and he's commenting on Enlightenment philosophy as it happens, and he's making a really important contribution to the Christian understanding and response to the Enlightenment, and I'd never heard of him before. So I started fishing around, and the first thing I found was this book by Oswald Bayer, who turns out to be John's uh, professor. Uh, John studied under him, um, and this is a very good introduction to the topic of uh, Johann Georg Hammond. Uh, and after reading this, I then came across this book and John. So having read the book, really enjoyed it, opened my eyes to a unique and a very distinct Christian mind who we really ought to get more airplay. So I emailed John and thanked him very much for it. And in the process, we discovered that he and Jason Fletcher, who is the chair of our board at Christian Heritage, are cousins. So it's a really small world, isn't it? Uh, and a, a, a peculiarly lovely one. So um, John um, has agreed uh, to do a presentation for us this evening. And so here's the order of the events. I'm going to turn over to John and he's going to present an outline of uh, Hammond, uh, his work, his significance, and talk it through for you uh, from his own perspective. And that will last for approximately half an hour. What I'd like you to do is if you've got questions, that are arising um, on the way, why don't you type those into chat and we'll, we'll draw on those later. But at the end of his half an hour period, we're gonna open up for questions, Q and A anyway. And if you want to ask him a question, raise your hand and wave it at me uh, and make suggestive noises or something like that. And uh, then you can get a chance to ask your, your question of him direct. But if it's in chat, I'll field it for you anyway. Okay, so I hope that's a useful order the evening. And I'm gonna turn you over now to John, who will be ably uh, aided by Joshua, who will run his presentation for him. So here we go. Fingers crossed, folks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, it's a sincere pleasure and a real honor to be with you all uh, today, uh, on the day after July 4th, as it happens, when we're celebrating our American independence from you all. Um, uh, even if I can't be with you in person, uh, living in these strange times of pandemics and video conferencing has given new meaning to the expression of being with one another in spirit rather than in the flesh. Um, our lives seem to be disincarnating as a result. But please don't take me for a ghost because what you're seeing is a real image of a real person who lives in Indiana in the shadows of the University of Notre Dame with a wife, three kids, and a cocker spaniel. It's also a special privilege to be speaking to you given some fortuitous connections that Kevin mentioned. I, I know several of you, uh, your local faculty in Cambridge, and my cousin, as Kevin mentioned, is Jason Fletcher, who many of you know as the headmaster of Heritage School. In recent weeks, it's also been a pleasure to be in communication with Kevin and to learn about his own scholarship on Augustus Top, Top Lady. Um, and I have to confess, I did not know, not know that much about him beforehand either. So I, I'm, I've been getting an education in the last few weeks myself. Um, as for our topic today, it was decided that I would talk about the late 18th century German Lutheran Johann Georg Hamm. 
who lived from, as Kevin said, from 1730 to 1788 in a port town on the Baltic, which was then called Königsberg and belonged to Prussia, but which today belongs to Russia and is called Kaliningrad. As it happens, this was also the hometown of Hamann's more famous friend and intellectual rival, Immanuel Kant, who was a, pro a professor at the Albertina University in Königsberg. Kant, of course, was a leading figure and arguably the most important philosopher of the German Enlightenment. Indeed, Kant could be considered the philosophical architect of modern secular society, since with greater rigor than anyone else, he tried to ground everything from philosophy to politics to religion in both the critical scrutiny and critical exercise of reason. Hamann, on the other hand, was less confident about the success of Kant's program and was, in fact, the very first critic of Kant's critical philosophy, who called his critique of Kant a meta-critique for that reason. It is with Hamann, therefore, that the term meta-critique and all its variants, such as metacritical, originates. I will say more about the details of his meta-critique in due course. For now, let me just say that he was the first to see a black hole, as it were, forming behind the Enlightenment, which would one day consume it. In other words, he saw that what we know as secular modernity would not be able to sustain itself and would one day collapse into what we today call post-modernity, a situation in which confidence in the powers of reason to illuminate reality and establish society has all but vanished. Hamann keenly pre uh, predicted all of this and did so well before his more alarmist friend, Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi, who played an important role in the pantheism controversy and later in the atheism controversy. In any case, it is for these reasons that Hamann has sometimes been labeled as a so-called counter enlightenment figure. But this is a very crude way of putting it because Hamann was not an irrationalist as the famous Isaiah Berlin was wont to describe him. Otherwise Goethe, an admirer of Hamann and an avid collector of his writings would never have called him the most brilliant mind of his time. He was simply a critic of a superficial and uncritical form of rationality that was masquerading as an angel of light, but was concealing its own confusion and darkness. And in this respect, following my Tübingen teacher that Kevin already mentioned, the Lutheran systematic theologian, Oswald Bayer, Hamann was not a knee-jerk counter-enlightener, a mere reactor to what was happening around him, but a radical enlightener who brought light to the darkness lurking in Kant's ostensibly luminous philosophy. So that is the theme that I would like to explore with you today, Hamann as a radical enlightener, in order, if possible, to help us to see why Goethe considered this obscure figure who stands in the background of the German enlightenment, the most brilliant mind of his time, and how Hamann might help us to sort out the mixed legacy of the enlightenment. In my view, however, this is no mere historical exercise for the sake of a better understanding of the history of ideas. On the contrary, because the Enlightenment has shaped our world more than any other philosophical project or movement of modern times, I think that Haman is immensely important today, and all the more so to Christians who would want to think about the origins of modern society and how apologetically to engage it. In other words, I think that we still have critical things to learn from him and that we must learn if we are meta-critically to engage with modern critical persons about everything from faith and reason to the nature of human society. Moreover, building on Goethe's own estimation of Hamann, we can draw further support for our under undertaking from a crowd of reputable, wit reputable witnesses who attested to Hamann's genius and importance to the church in the modern world. In this regard, I would like to begin with the three quotes that I appended as epigraphs to the introduction of my book on Haman. Um, and Josh, you can, you can turn now to the quote, if you'd like, from uh, the first quote from Friedrich Schlegel. Friedrich Schlegel was the leader, arguably, of the German Romantics, and he had this to say, with Kantianism, we have wasted years that will never return. This immensely wise and profound thinker the seer we did not recognize and heed. Wilhelm Diltai said something similarly praise, uh, in, in praise of Hamann. 
He said, Hamann's writings are without question the most brilliant among believing German Protestants of the 18th century. In a certain sense, Hamann lives on. Indeed, he is even more important than before. He is one of the profoundest Christians and defenders of Christianity in our time. And even more remarkably, Jean Paul, the romantic novelist, um, I don't have a quote from him there, but he said this, Haman anticipated every time. Um, needless to say, uh, this is high praise coming from very famous intellectuals of the period. So let's find out why these believing intellectuals thought Haman was so important and a kind of prophet whose words we need to hear even today. To this end, I'll begin with a brief sketch of Haman's life and writings, taking each major text in order. Um, necessarily, I'll have to leave quite a few out, but I'll just focus on the ones that I think are the most important. This will help us to get a better sense of his circumstances, from his conversion in 1758 to his late metacritical writings. And then in conclusion, I'll try to summarize what I take to be Haman's abiding gift, his two or three or more mites to the church in the modern world. So I'll begin then with his life and writings. I've already noted that he's from Königsberg and, and there's a um, image of Königsberg uh, somewhere in there. Um, a few other things to note about his early years is that his father was the town bather and barber surgeon. He was some, someone all the townspeople would come to for their, these services. And his father's occupation turned out to be highly significant, significant to Hamann as well. When Johann Gottfried Herder, Hamann's student wrote to him in the 1780s asking about an edition of Hamann's writings and what they should be called. Hamann humorously replied, metacritical tubs. Now, there's nothing particularly glamorous about tubs, bathing tubs, and that's part of the point. They're a humble means of providing important service. And Hamann thought similarly of his writings. He wanted to give his critical contemporaries, his rational contemporaries, his secular contemporaries, a much needed metacritical bath. And we should not pass over the baptismal illusion here either, because Haman saw his vocation precisely as that of a modern day John the Baptist, who was called to prepare the way for the Lord as a preacher in the wilderness. In this case, in the wilderness or the desert of the modern world, as he saw it forming around him. But I'm getting ahead of myself because Haman's vocation was the result of a dramatic conversion other than being a remarkably gifted philologist, his second teacher regarded him as a prodigy in the translation of Greek and Latin texts. Um, his early life is, a rather, is rather unremarkable. After finishing first in his class, he went to the local university where he majored in classical and belletristic literature and collaborated with some friends on a journal modeled on the English tablo. After graduating, he subsequently served as a house tutor, a Hofmeister, for a few families in the Baltic and translated several works in French and English, including from Shaftesbury, one of which, a French work on commerce, was eventually published. He thereafter worked for his best friend, Christoph Behrens, who had a trading firm in Riga, also a port town on the Baltic. Um, and that led to a trade mission to London in 1756. Although we can't be sure about the details of this mission, it seems that Haman was trying to secure an alliance between the English and the Baltic port cities, which hoped to gain greater freedom from Russia, for, excuse me, from Prussia. But the Seven Years' War was about to break out, and since the English shifted their alliance to Prussia, Haman's mission was seemingly doomed from the start. So he arrived in London already a failure. And for whatever reason, he didn't take this failure lightly. His life quickly sped out of control. It's a familiar story comparable to that of Augustine. He says in his journal that he freely ate, and this is the London writings that we're talking about here. There's an image there of that text in German. It's not yet been translated, although I should say someone has finally undertaken a translation of it into English. So you might look out for that. Um, I'd hoped to do that at some point, but never got around to it. But it's arguably a kind of work that comparable to Augustine's Confessions, um, a kind of modern confessions. Um, it's really wonderful stuff. And it's not as obscure as, as his other works. It's quite easy to read, actually. In any case, he says here in his London writings that he freely ate, freely drank, made love, caroused, 
alternating between gluttony and reflection, between reading and knavery, between industriousness and complete indolence. Soon, he says, he was 300 pounds in debt and didn't have enough money to go home. So he remained in London without any friends or source of income except random attempts at being a musician. Um, and he ended up moving restlessly from one place to another every four weeks for about a year. Then in the midst of his desperation in early 1758, he procured a Bible and started reading it from cover to cover. And on the second full reading, he began to perceive God speaking to him through the stories of the Old Testament. He perceived through what he later called scripture's metastomatic power that he was Cain, that he was Israel, that he was enslaved in Egypt longing for freedom, and that in some strange way the Bible was addressed to him. And then, um, Josh, if you go to the next quote, um, he recounts his conversion as follows. He says, on the evening of March 31st, as I was reading the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy, I fell into deep reflection, thought about Abel, of whom God said, the earth opened its mouth to receive the blood of your brother. And suddenly I felt my heart beat. I heard a voice sighing and wailing in its depths as the voice of blood, as the voice of a murdered brother who wanted to avenge his blood if I did not hear it and should continue to stop my ears to its voice. I understood that precisely this was what made Cain a restless fugitive. I felt at once my heart swelling. It poured itself out in tears, and I could no longer hide from God that I was the murderer of my brother, that I was the murderer of his only begotten son. It's a classical but rather intense conversion story. But what's extremely important to, to understanding Haman's subsequent vocation and writings is that it's a conversion that occurred through his reading of the Old Testament, which Haman knew very well most of his contemporaries held in contempt, as in Voltaire's Sermon on the Fifty. There, Voltaire says, you know, my brethren, what horror took hold of us when we read together the writings of the Hebrews, concentrating only on all, on the, all those features offensive to purity, charity, good faith, justice, and universal reason. That's Voltaire. Haman, however, based on his own experience, replied with a citation from Horace. He says, why do you laugh? Quid rides de te fabula narratur. What are you laughing about? The, the story is about you. Um, so that was his experience. That he found that the scriptures were speaking to him, as it were, in a fable. They were addressed directly to him in some mysterious way. I'll return to this contrast between Haman and the rationalist reading of scripture presently, but for now, I'll just recap Haman's conversion in his own words. He says that God poured him from one vessel into another and that the spirit of God continued in spite of my great weakness, in spite of the long resistance that I had previously mounted against his witness and stirrings to reveal to me more and more the mystery of divine love and the benefit of faith in our merciful and only savior. Now, to return to the contrast with Voltaire, what Haman's conversion taught him, or what his supposedly enlightened contemporaries couldn't see, is that God hides himself, so to speak, from those who think they are wise and learned, or reveals himself to little children, as our Lord says. And of course, the most obvious case of this hiddenness is our Lord himself, whose life was mostly a hidden one, and whose glory during the last year, years of his earthly life was not recognized except on rare occasions by the disciples. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal his to you. But what is so striking here and makes Haman's, Haman arguably the answer to every modern, secular, and ostensibly enlightened objection to the Old Testament, from Christopher Hitchens to Richard Dawkins, is that the glory of the Spirit of God is likewise hidden from the eyes of the proud in every age who typically take offense at either the mythological form of the stories of the Old Testament or their questionable histories or their occasional crudeness and violence. And to be honest, I think we have to take their offense seriously because there is reason to be troubled by some of the things that we find there, especially passages, passages in which God appears to be legislating genocide and so forth. I think there's no way that a modern person will not be scandalized by such things or by the manner in which Israel at times obtains victory over its enemies. 
Um, I, for one, you know, find it hard to read the story of the death of Sisera at the hand of Jael. Um, that's a story that could keep one up at night. Um, and to be honest, I think it's a mistake to try to argue apologetically that God can do whatever God wants and that we shouldn't be troubled by such things. And that may be true, but I think Haman would advise us to ask ourselves whether we ourselves are seeing scripture aright, or whether we too, like those hostile to scripture and hostile to Christianity, are seeing only the outward form of scripture and not its inner meaning. The difference between being here that we, if we are Christian, affirm the outward form while modern secularists would reject it and then end up rejecting everything. Um, so again, I think they have some of this modern secularists would have reason for rejecting uh, that form of scripture if we merely consider the dissonance between what we find in some of the passages in the Old Testament and what our Lord himself says about loving our enemies and so forth. Um, and what I think Haman is suggesting to us is that the Bible needs to be read as a whole. And to read it holistically is for Haman to read it Christologically, in light of Christ from beginning to end. And this means, following Haman, that we have to see the coincidence of the form of Christ, the form of our Lord, the outward form, um, and the form of Scripture. Accordingly, to be a good apologist for Scripture we have to see that the form of scripture is occasionally scandalous, as scandalous as the cross of our Lord himself was to any Jewish or Greek observer. For gods don't die, they reasonably, I mean, one would reasonably, reasonably think, and certainly not on a cross, as Nietzsche said. For his part, Kierkegaard saw that to be Christian, we have to recognize these stumbling blocks. We have to recognize the paradox, so to speak, of the incarnation. And in this respect, Kierkegaard was thinking with Haman, whom Kierkegaard admired like no one else in the modern period. But Haman goes farther than Kierkegaard because Haman saw that a Christian likewise has to come to a stop, a halt, not just before the incarnation, but before the form of the Old Testament, if one is really to say that one has faith that these writings are inspired writings. If one is to see that these rags, as Haman was happy to call them, in an allusion to the rags by which Jeremiah was raised out of the pit, are in fact the glorious instruments of our salvation. So Haman thinks that the, the form of scripture is rag-like. There's nothing immediately admirable about it. And yet it's the word of God. And so I think that's the most important upshot of Haman's conversion. I mean, what he teaches us about how to read and love scripture and, how, and um, how we do an injustice to the scriptures if we don't read it in light of Christ. I mean, so this means one needs to attend for Haman to the humility of its form as well as its prophetic content. For truly, as Christ says, it is all about him, the Old Testament, the Torah, the prophets, the writings, including the humility of scripture's clothing, so to speak, which is to say the humility of its form and appearance which gives us no greater assurance of its inspiration than the unassuming form of the Son of Man gave us when he walked the streets of Jerusalem. So to return to our story, uh, somehow Haman eventually gets on a ship back to Königsberg and everything had changed, including his relationship with his best friend, Behrens. Behrens did not want to accept Haman's conversion to Orthodox Christianity, seeing it as a betrayal of their modern ideals. And so he did what he could to bring Haman around. And that is back to being a good enlightener. And he recruited none other than Kant, the greatest philosopher of the time for the job. Um, I'm tempted to call it a kind of intellectual hit job because Haman had no idea that Kant would be joining them for dinner that night. By all accounts, it was a setup. And so it came to pass that the three of them met at a rural inn for dinner and Kant tried kindly we may assume, to talk some sense into him. Haman though was not amused and it led to a falling out with his friend Behrens who subsequently denied Haman his sister's hand in marriage, the one Haman had intended to marry. So there were consequences uh, uh, like that for his uh, coming from his, verge, uh, his conversion as well. For his part, Kant followed up with Haman hoping that the two of them could collaborate on a physics book for children. The proposal 
could not have been more suitable for Haman's wit and his witty reply. In a series of rather cheeky letters to, to Kant, he tells him that, he takes, that it takes humility to write for children. Moreover, that Kant himself could not understand nature, could not understand physics anyway, since nature is written in a divine language that Kant couldn't understand, lacking the spirit of its inspiration. Then came Haman's Socratic memorabilia in 1759, which is the first of Haman's pseudonymous publications. And I should note that he didn't publish anything in his own name. I mean, he was a completely pseudonymous author. Um, and in this way, he anticipates Kierkegaard who followed suit. Um, so here in this text here, the Socratic memorabilia, um, I think we have a cover, there's an image of it. Thanks, Josh. Um, Haman's pen name here is a lover of boredom. Uh, and the worst work you can, you can see there, it's addressed to two. Um, two um, and the two here are Kant and Behrens. And the title, as, as, as you can see, is Socratic in nature. Um, there are several takeaways from this work, but the chief of them is that Haman turns the standard rationalist view of Socrates on its head. Whereas his contemporaries appealed to Socrates as a champion of reason and learning against superstition, Haman presents him as a champion of faith and ignorance against naive rationalism. It's, it's a quite brilliant move, I think. In an age of Diderot's encyclopedie, an enlightened progress, Haman reminds us that Socrates was said to be wise by the Oracle of Delphi because he knew he was ignorant. Um, and if you, Josh, if you go to the next slide. It says here, Socrates seems to have talked as much about his ignorance as a hypochondriac about his imagined illness. But it was precisely this, Haman goes on to say, that was the source of his supernal wisdom. Sophocles and Euripides would never have become such great models for the theater were it not for their art of analyzing the human heart, but Socrates surpassed them both in wisdom since he'd come further in self-knowledge than they had and knew that he knew nothing. In other words, unlike Haman's contemporaries, Socrates was humble, and because he recognized his weaknesses and ignorance, he was open to a kind of proto-Christian wisdom which Haman directly correlates with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter eight. Um, and you can go to the next slide. And I, this is one of my favorite passages in all of Haman's works. He says, for the testimony that Socrates gave of his ignorance, I know of no more honorable seal and at the same time, no better key than the oracle of the great teacher of the Gentiles. If anyone thinks that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if someone loves God, he is known by him, just as Socrates was known by Apollo to be a wise man. But as the seed of all our natural wisdom must decay and perish into ignorance, and as from this death, from this nothing, the life and nature of a higher knowledge must spring forth newly created, thus far the nose of a sophist doesn't reach. Again, we have a reversal of the conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom tells us that wisdom is found through learning, it's the fruit of learning, it's the fruit of the greedy acquisition of knowledge, not unlike the first temptation. But Haman says with Paul, and in the tradition of learned ignorance, stemming from Kuz's doctrine of learned ignorance, he says that true wisdom is deeper than that, and that knowledge can in fact get in the way of wisdom if it brings pride with it. For knowledge, as Paul says, puffs up, but love builds up. Moreover, he tells us that real knowledge consists not in what we actively know, but in our passively being known by God. Another reversal. In any case, if one wants to look for Haman's understanding of what it means to be born again, we also need to look no further than what he says here. To be born again for Haman is not simply a matter of assent to the truths of the Christian faith, but a personal suffering of these truths. More precisely, a suffering of one's own weakness and ignorance and need for the light of Christ. Indeed, a suffering of what he calls a descensus ad infras, a descent into the hell of self-knowledge, from which point, as from a kind of death, one can begin to rise anew with Christ into a newness of life. As he puts it elsewhere, nothing but the descent into hell of self-knowledge paves the way for our deification. From such statements, we can perhaps begin to see why Haman possessed a kind of timeless wisdom as Jean-Paul claimed for him. 
For inspired by the same spirit that inspired Paul, his own words echo those of the apostles in the middle of an age that smugly satis was sug smugly satisfied that it had, had all the answers to the world's problems or was on the cusp of solving them. Haman was wiser because he was more humble or he was more humble because he was wiser. And so it was in the guise of Socrates that he began his public authorship, albeit pseudonymous. In an attempt to do what Socrates did, <clears throat> to engage his contemporaries in their own language with full awareness of their own vocabulary and terminology in order like Socrates to lure his fellow citizens out of the labyrinth of their learned soph sophists to a truth that lies in a hidden place, to a secret wisdom and away from idolatry to the worship of an unknown God. Not the God of reason, not, the, not a mere regulative principle as for Kant, but the God of faith who's found in the depths of the humble heart. Just one more note here about the Socratic memorabilia because it's important to Haman's metacritical deconstruction of Kant's critical philosophy. Though the word faith means much more than belief <clears throat> in the everyday philosophical sense of the word, um, the sense, for example, in which David Hume uses it, Haman exploits the fact that German has only one word for faith and belief, namely Glaube. And so in the Socratic memorabilia, he goes on to make a point of Hume's philosophical contention that we know nothing except through faith in order to undermine the presumption of a kind of rationality that believed it could support itself and society without any faith. Haman follows Hume here. Faith is involved in any number of cognitive operations, including our belief in the existence of an external world. Even that we take on faith at some level. Every day we take things on faith, um, but it is not something that one, strictly speaking, can demonstrate as Wittgenstein for one pointed out to, to Moore um, some years ago. The rationalist therefore should think twice before setting faith aside since it is involved in all our reasoning, whether we know it or not. In other words, reason is not enough. Simply put, it's not enough. Ultimately, we can't get along with faith in something. Otherwise, the whole rational house of cards will fall. And that's the basic point, you could say, of this meta critique too. So in many ways, Haman's Socratic memorabilia is a kind of preparation for the gospel and for a specifically Christian aesthetics, a specifically Christian way of looking at the world. For according to ancient Christian tradition, the doors of perception have to be cleansed before we can see the world aright. And to see the world aright for Haman is to see it as a canonic self-emptying communication of divine things to the creature through the creature. And so according to a precise Christian logic, we come to Haman's next major work, though it amounts to no more than a dense little tract of 20 or so pages, his aesthetics in a, in a nutshell, Aesthetic in Nuce, in a subtitle, A Rhapsody in Kabbalistic Prose. We could spend 15 minutes or more just talking about the title. And this is exactly what Haman invites us to do. In fact, he once referred to his titles as Orphic Eggs, which is to say mysterious and pregnant you know, uh, with meaning. But let's try just a couple minutes more. Uh, by aesthetics in a nutshell, he means the kind of aesthetics peculiar to Christianity and aesthetics that recognizes beauty in disguise, even under a contrary form. The way that the nutritious element of a nut is hidden under a rough exterior and you have to crack it open to get to it. For it is in this way, Haman averse, that God appears so humbly that his glory is hidden under a rough exterior whether we are talking about the form of the son of God in his incarnation, who had no form or comeliness that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him, or about the form of the Old Testament, which Haman's contemporaries considered at best silly or at worst morally repugnant, or even the vulgar style of the Greek New Testament, the, the koine, the common tongue, which is stylistically inferior, one could say, to the classical works of the pagans. Or finally, the form of creation itself, whose divine workmanship can at times be so imperceptible that one can legitimately wonder whether God exists and there is anything more than nature there. What is so striking about Haman's apologetics, if I may call it that, is that he is entirely willing to concede that divine revelation does not overpower our sensibility. 
In fact, so little does it do so that one can look at Christ and see nothing but a carpenter's son. Or we can look at the Old Testament, read the Old Testament and see nothing but stories of an ancient people that one might just go ahead and reject as, as not being relevant to us today. Or one might look at the heavens, which to the psalmist declare the glory of God. One could see them, as Shakespeare says, as nothing but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. Um, John Henry Newman says something similar. From a purely natural perspective, the world could even seem abandoned. Um, according to a kind of Gnosticism or Manichaeism. Hamann concedes all these things because the natural man, the fallen man, precisely can't see the glory of God. That's a kind of standard kind of trope of the Reformation. Not in, and so we can't see it in Christ naturally, we can't see it in the scriptures naturally, and we can't necessarily see it in creation naturally. Because this revelation, the revelation in Christ, in the scriptures, in creation, is hidden, Hamann says, under a humble form, under a form so lowly and so ordinary that no one who is not inspired with the eyes of a lover of God can see it. And Josh, if you'd go to the next slide, here's some uh, quotes that I'd like to read. From his Cloverleaf of Hellenistic Letters, he writes, if the divine style that lets the foolish, the trivial, the base, in order to put to shame the strength and ingenuity of all profane authors, and eyes that are illumined, inspired, armed with the jealousy of a friend, a confidant, a lover, are required to recognize in such disguise the beams of heavenly glory. In some for Haman, God, whom he knew to be an author, the author of his life, among others, had a style, a particular style, the way authors have styles. And the following passage from his Estetica in Nuce is arguably the key to this style, which Haman himself, himself strove in his own way to imitate. The unity of the author is reflected in the dialect of his words. In all one tone of immeasurable height and depth, a proof of the most glorious majesty and the most complete self emptying In other words, to know the author of the world, to know the creator, we have to understand God's style, the dialect in which he speaks, the dialect of his word, a dialect that is revealed in Christ who is the key to the whole economy, the key to the dialectic dialect of, of the scriptures, and the key to, by extension, to the dialect of creation. A dialect that unites majesty and abasement, glory and kenosis, and one might even say heaven and earth. It's really no exaggeration to say that Haman is perhaps the most anti-Gnostic Christian since Irenaeus. Um, and the closest modern example is perhaps the French poet Charles Peggy. Um, in any case, the basic point of the Aesthetica is that to see the world aright is to see the world in the spirit of Christ. And that allows us to see it all anew, from how we see the scriptures, to how we see history, to how we see it in the most ordinary details of our lives. In Haman's words, it's to see or to hear God speaking to the creature through the creature. That's a, a, kind of a phrase from his estate, to the creature through the creature. In other words, for Haman, by virtue of faith in Christ, the logos, the word, the whole world is verbalized. It becomes logical in a higher sense. It becomes a world full of significance. What a philosopher like Kant would call phenomena, whose ground, the so-called thing in itself, we can't make out, become for Haman phonomena, the material soundings or words of the logos, who is always trying to communicate with us. The most important upshot of this extraordinary little text, the Estetica, though, I think is Haman's defense of the Old Testament against the rationalists, against the Voltaires, against the historical critics like Mike Michaelis, uh, Johann David Michaelis in Goethe, who was the, the founder of modern historical criticism. Haman knew that the Bible couldn't be understood by such methods because it requires the spirit of Christ in order to understand it. To a purely rational person, a rational exegete, a rational scholar that, that you find in universities today, you would think, well, it's going to be impenetrable. Um, and people will write the scriptures off um, just as surely as Herod dismissed Christ. And Haman draws that analogy. He says that's exactly what people will do. Rational, her, her, rational exegetes will just write off the scriptures and their interpretation. They'll see nothing in it as surely as Herod saw nothing in Christ. Um, so, um, when we understand that the Holy 
Old Testament is a prophetic text though, everything changes. For then we can see for Haman that it's all about Christ, as our Lord himself says in Luke 24. From the story of Isaac carrying wood up Moriah to the, to the story of Joseph, the beloved son clothed in glory, being betrayed by his brothers and left for dead, only to, to rise up from the pit and the dungeon to the right hand of Pharaoh and so forth. For Haman, all these things are allegories about Christ. They're teaching us about who Christ is. And if we can go to the next slide, um, this is the one more major quote from the Aesthetica Nuce that kind of brings this point home. He says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. This first sign whereby the, he revealed the majesty of his servant form, transfigures the holy books of the covenant into good old wine, which confounds the steward's judgment and strengthens the weak stomach of the art critics. If you read the prophetic books without understanding Christ, he's quoting here Augustine, what an exceedingly insipid and fatuous things you will find. But if you perceive Christ in them, what you will read will not only be to your taste, but it will intoxicate you. Okay, so Haman's next major set of writings, I'll, I'll pass over. Those are his, because I only have about five, I'll spend about five or 10 minutes at most. Um, I think Kevin get, if, uh, can go about 40 minutes. Uh, I'll, then I'll just, uh, we'll get to the question and answer session. I think that's probably more important, but I want to get to the metacritique meta quickly. So I'll pass over what I was going to say about his, his, his Herder Schriften, his uh, writings about Herder and the origin of language, um, and just come to his, his metacritique. Um, so um, I'm skipping over quite a few texts. And so these are his late works now, um, his twin texts of 1784, the metacritique of the purism of reason and his Golgotha and Shablimini. And there's an image there you had, you saw here of, of him and Kant, um, uh, just a great pair. In some ways, I think this is, that's, that's the, the battle of the modern world. Uh, just it's incarnated in these two figures, Kant and Haman. Um, it's like reason and faith right there together. <laughs> and in um, any case, so um, Haman called these twins, you know, for good reason, these works, um, because they really do go together. Um, uh, Golgotha and Shablimini, um, I'll just say something quickly about that title, uh, uh, Golgotha. Uh, that, uh, um, there's, a, there's a picture there of the, of the title. If you go down a few more, Josh, you'll see the, the image there. Um, of the Golgotha and Shalimini. Uh, it's uh, the pseudonym there is by a, a preacher in the desert. So that is his work, you know, that's directed in, against Moses, his friend, Moses Mendelssohn. And, and it's concerned with Mo Moses Mendelssohn's text, Jerusalem. Um, the meta critique of, of the purism of reason is concerned obviously with Immanuel Kant. Um, so um, these texts are genuinely subversive. Of, I think, um, and I think that's a kind of something that you highlighted in, in the title for the, for the, the talk today. Um, they're very subversive, you could say, of the established order, um, but they're subversive, I would say, ultimately of an uncritical rationality um, that would too strictly separate public reason from faith, history, and tradition. So that's kind of the point I want to get to. The, the reason Haman is so subversive is that these works criticize an uncritical rationality, an uncritical criticism that would too strictly separate reason from faith, history, and tradition, okay? um, ultimately fostering the illusion that there is such a thing as a pure secular space. But let me let me back up a bit here. Let's let's just go to um, go if we can go a few slides up and first talk about um, the the three purisms here. Um, the and from the Metacritique of, of the Purism of Reason. Um, it's preceded by an un, unpublished review of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, uh, which was of course published in 1781. And interestingly enough, um, um, Hama, uh, Kant published the, the Critique of Pure Reason through Haman's mediation with the publisher Hartnock, who was another friend of Haman's. Uh, and then whether he should have done this or not, I don't know, it's a, a moral question, but Haman kind of surreptitiously you know, had a good long look at the proofs before um, it was published and he wrote a review in response to it. Um, it's the first review of the Critique of Pure Reason and he did not publish it out of respect for Kant. In fact, he didn't even publish 
the meta critique because out of respect for Kant, um, because Kant was a good friend and so forth. Um, it's an interesting, very quite interesting. Um, but in any case, his basic point here, um, which is rather devastating, I think, and I think Haman has won out in, in the philosophical world too. His basic point is that Kant's notion of pure reason is a fiction. That's a huge claim, but that's, that's his basic point. There's no such thing as pure reason. There's no such thing as secular reason either. Because essentially, we know nothing a priori. We know nothing apart from faith. We know nothing apart from history. We know nothing apart from tradition. And yet the whole of the modern world is erected upon this supposition that there is such a thing as pure reason. And that if we wanted to, perhaps we might be able to entertain the ideas of other traditions and things like that. Haman thought that was complete nonsense. Um, so um, the whole critique, the whole enterprise, um, the whole enterprise of Kant and the Enlighteners, Haman thought was ill-founded. It was founded upon an empty conception of reason. Um, and so, we, so in this work, that Metacritique, he's criticizing what he calls the purifications of reason. And if we go to the first purification, I'll summarize these rather quickly. The first purification um, you can read there is consists in the, uh, go back one here, Josh, uh, uh, consisted in the partly misunderstood, partly unsuccessful attempt to make reason independent of all tradition and faith in it. Hama thinks that that's false, that's erroneous. You, you can't you know, have any reason that is purified of tradition. There is no such thing. All reasoning is, is reasoning within a context, within a community, with things that have been passed down and that you're processing. You might be reasonably processing them, but you're still processing things that have been handed down to you. Um, the second purification is even more transcendent, he says, and comes down to nothing less than an independence from experience and its everyday induction. For after reason over a period of 2000 years, so one knows not what beyond experience, it not only suddenly comes to despair over the progressive course of its predecessors, but with just as much defiance promises to its patient, impatient contemporaries that it will produce in only a short time that universal and infallible philosopher's stone necessary, necessary for Catholicism and despotism to which religion will straightaway submit its holiness and law of it giving its majesty. In other words, he's saying that this kind of universal rationality will be a kind of a new religion, a new kind of despotic religion, he thinks. And so a modern secular reason is for him a kind of despotic religion um, of sorts. Um, so the, um, um, the third critique though, he thinks is even, is, you could say is even more devastating. The third most refined uh, purification, um, most empyrean purism, is conducted with regard even to language, which he says is the only first and last organon and criterion of reason, which has no other credentials than tradition and use. In other words, you cannot purify reason from language, which is itself an historical traditional phenomenon, obviously. Um, and so the whole notion of, a, of pure reason is purely fictitious. Um, so, to go back to you know, the, the, what I was saying earlier um, about the, the upshot of Haman's metacritique, it's a, it's a, a critique uh, of an illusion, the illusion of a pure secular space. There is for Haman no such thing. And this is why John Milbank, my, another teacher following Haman, makes the same point in the opening line of his famous work, Theology and Social Theory. Um, once, John says there, once there was no secular. Um, there, John is talking more about the fact that the word secular was co-opted and repurposed for secular purposes, when originally it designated the theological space between the fall and eschaton. In other words, the way people understand secular today is a kind of overlay over a more basic theological meaning. But John and the whole movement of or radical orthodoxy, which you probably know something about is premised on Haman's notion that there is no secular in the modern sense of the term because there's no such thing as a pure neutral reason or rationality to ground any such thing. And that in a nutshell is the point of the meta critique. Although we have to wait until Golgotha and Shablimini to see the political implications. 
So I think maybe I'll just stop here because I've gone over. Um, I've gone a good 40 minutes, I think. So I'll just stop there um, and um, uh, maybe open it up for, for questions um, or first for Kevin's questions, um, however you'd like to proceed. Thank you. Well, I, I would be quite happy to just let you go on and on um, because I love this. I hope you're all finding this as exciting as I have. This is just a wonderful topic uh, to get to grips with. Um, and um, I've had in the questions a bit of, uh, um, from Richard wanted to know a, a good place to start with reading um, on this. So I've, I've given him some information which uh, I, I hope is helpful. Um, but I'm wondering if anybody else, before I plough in with some of my questions, because this is my opportunity to milk John dry during the course of our, our evening together, um, do any of the rest of you have got, uh, Rich has put his thumb up, but I think he's already asked, um, any of the rest of you would uh, like to raise uh, any uh, questions that you'd like to ask? Because um, there's a lot we could talk about here. Is there anything you'd like clarification on? from what uh, John has said so far. Thank you, Joe. Yes, can you say a little bit more about uh, what you meant by the, uh, the form of scripture? Yeah. What, is, I mean, what, what does that involve? What uh, implications does that have? And, yeah. Sure, so. About, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So by form, I mean the outward form, the letter, as opposed to the spirit. If you want to make a distinction between the, the material form and the inner spirit, or I mean, in some ways, this is just going back to kind of origins. I mean, my, you know, Jason, my cousin, uh, wrote, did his MPhil on the origin, if I remember correctly. He might be able to tell us some things about this. But in fact, I mean, Haman is drawing on origin and Augustine um, in his understanding of scripture's outward form, because origin talked about scripture as being like a nut. I mean, the, out, the outward form of it is, is rough. I mean, he talks about the stylus atrox, this atrocious outward style. Um, so if you're, a, if you're a kind of modern person, you're reading the Old Testament, you might not find the style very appealing. You might find a bunch of disconnected stories that you find, you know, silly perhaps. You might even find them silly or what, whatever. A modern person might have that reaction to the outward form. Um, but what the but what Origen and Augustine and Haman were all saying is that that's precisely why God has hidden hidden um, the glory in these in this in these earthen vessels. So in the same way that the glory is hidden in us as earthen vessels, and same and the glory is hidden in the material vessel of the material stories of Scripture. So there's a there's a spiritual there's spiritual meat there. But, but an unbeliever won't be able to penetrate it because they'll just throw the nut away. So that's kind of what I mean. So it's just in the same way that, that our Lord himself had no form or appearance. It's precisely that that we're talking about. Um, so we, when, if, we were, if we were in the, walking through Jerusalem and saw our Lord, we might not recognize him. So in the same way, a person opening up the Bible might not recognize that this is the word of God. Okay. That's, that's, so that's what I mean. I mean, the outward yeah. form, the outward style, the appearance. And, and John, yeah, you. Do, you, do you think that that kind of understanding would have then gone on to influence and affect the way in which Hammond himself goes about the business of writing? Um, Absolutely. Do you want to unpack that a little bit? Because he, he is a very difficult man to read, isn't he? He did. And so he's imitating the very style of scripture in his own scriptures. I mean, his own writing is an imitation of the style of the Holy Spirit as he understands it. So, um, and he, so he wanted to be, he wanted to be a Christian author in the, in the profoundest sense, so far as, I mean, he says at one point, shockingly to Herder, he says, I will have done my job if, pe if people speak of me the way they spoke of the Lord. Like they're saying, it, or the, he says at one point, like they, he has an unclean spirit, he says at one point. If people reject him and say that yeah, he's not one of us, um, or they think there's something wrong, or um, 
then he, he says, I will, if I have, will have incurred a, 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 the judgment, if I will have been rejected by my contemporaries, then I will have succeeded in a way. Um, and having fulfilled um, my authorship. I mean, he wanted to be so much like Christ as to be rejected by his contemporaries. It's peculiar. I think that's part of it, I think. But in the, at the very least, he wanted to imitate the style, the, 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 the rough style, as it were, of the Old T Testament that he thought was going to be impenetrable to a rational mind, a rationalistic mind. Um, and that put as a, I think, as an epigraph to, to the presentation, light shines in the darkness. So Haman's whole authorship is playing on that too. I mean, it's a, it's a reversal of the whole of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is about a kind of immediate clarity, clear and distinct ideas. But Haman says, no, 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 no. That's not the way it is. The light shines in the darkness. Um, there is no immediate clarity like that. I mean, to, to, to find the light is to find Christ in the darkness of this world, so to speak. Um, yeah, so there's so many things going on there um, with his style. But at the very least, he's trying to imitate what he called the, the, the stilus atrox, um, this kind of rough exterior style. Um, and that's why he also was hiding in a way. He didn't want to have his name up front. He wrote in pseudonyms only. Um, he wanted, uh, yeah, he wanted whatever, uh, whatever the glory in, that there may be to his message, to, to, he wanted to hide and let the message of Christ go forth. Um, sorry, I'm not putting that very clearly right now, but I guess I'm excused by Hamlin's own style. <laughs> Um, it, it, it is, but I think you're, you're touching on the fact that he is such a paradoxical writer, isn't he, in yes. the way he goes about his business. And it, is that, that, in a sense, reflecting his own view of the, his paradox of aesthetics, of beauty, and of what matters in the world? Yeah, he, he yeah, um, in some ways he ensured that he would not become a popular writer, but he didn't want to be. Um, I mean, it's so peculiar. Um, I, I don't know if anyone has ever reflected so much as he has about what it means to be a Christian author um, in that sense. Um, but anyway, um, sorry, Kevin, I don't know if I answered your question. No, I, I think this is a really fruitful thing to think about because m most of us in this webinar probably haven't heard of Hammond before, or if we have it's fit like me it's it's been a fairly recent uh, experience and the the two things that really intrigued me one was that nobody knew about him or or very few but those who did thought he was utterly brilliant and you you alluded early on to some of those who attested to Hammond's significance um but uh, you know we've got Goethe we've got uh, Hegel we've got Kierkegaard all of whom rated him extremely highly. Um, so what was it that they saw that the rest of us haven't, do you think? I mean, it's some, for people like Goethe, I mean, he at least could have an aesthetic appreciation for, appreciation for what Hamann was doing, just as, as his literary genius. And because at one point Goethe says that, that clarity is a proper distribution of light and shadow. So it's not just full on light, that true clarity is that is going to, at least in, 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 in paintings and so forth, is going to know how to use light and darkness. Um, so, so Goethe had that stylistic appreciation for what Hamna was doing. And so he could understand that, in, and, and Hamna was trying to write in a kind of way that would, so that the light, lightning bolts would just kind of the lightning would, would come out of the clouds, as it were, of his writings. He want, was trying to do something like that, I think. But that's a purely, that's just Goethe's, the, the judgment of an unbeliever, really. The bottom line for Haman is that he's trying to do what we see in John 1, 5, right? The light shines in the darkness. That's the, that's the style, that's the model that he was pursuing. Um, and, um, but I, I think... Yeah, I, I, they all picked up different things from Haman. Um, Herder is a much more fam much more famous than Haman, but Herder is is only half of Haman. Um, Jacobi is an, is another famous disciple, 
um, who is you know, the, the, ad, the agitator of the pantheism controversy, the atheism controversy, and he's trying to do something good, but he's he's not as, not, the, not not nearly as as deep as Hahn. Um, um, but yeah, they all took a, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Kierkegaard is a little bit of Hahn. Um, Kierkegaard thought Hahn was uh, the greatest modern thinker. Mm. Period. Um, it, and yet today we don't know who he is. No. It, it's it is remarkable, but it's, it's because he didn't want to. He didn't promote himself. He did the opposite. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope that answer has has helped Ian Cooper, who raised a very uh, similar question in the thread here. Um, I want to allude to a question from Ranald, um, and Ranald has said, when you point out that Hammond deflated Kant's idea of a pure reason, saying it was fiction. Do you see a parallel in Schaeffer's presuppositional approach in which he argues that denying um, uh, that man is made an image of God or knowledge is rendered meaningless? Uh, I mean, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, if we if we no longer have any kind of basis in scripture or basis in faith, um, Haman thinks that we're not going to have any basis at all because we've rejected if we reject revelation, we have nothing more to stand on. Mm. If that's what, if, if I've answered Ronald's question, I, it's such a pleasure to have to, to know that Ronald's, um, you know, here. I, I, I can't tell you how, how much I, it, it meant to me to meet him years ago. Um, but I, in any case, uh, Kevin, maybe you could re rephrase the question if I didn't. Get it, it was a slightly long question, but uh, I, I think um, Ronald is looking for parallels in the way Schaefer approaches apologetics presuppositionally, arguing that once you've denied that man is made in the image of God, in fact, all knowledge then is rendered meaningless. So um, I think Ronald's wondering whether um, Hammond has actually um, preempted uh, Schaefer's approach. Oh, oh, I think, I mean, certainly, I mean, I mean, you, the moment you deny that the human being is the image of God, what do you have left? I mean, mm. I mean, well, the, then, uh, you know, what confidence do we have that we really can even intelligently explore or understand reality at all? Um, you know, I mean, you go down that line, you, you, once you reject revelation, then you then all that is left is something called reason. Well, today, we, there are many people who don't believe there is any such thing at all. Um, there are many people who don't believe that there's such a thing as persons or souls. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we, we've, 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 we've come to the point that many people are embracing complete nihilism. So from Haman's standpoint, the, you, you, get rid of, you get rid of revelation, it, everything's going to fall apart. Um, yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a presupposition of, for the intelligibility, really, of everything. If, if we don't recognize the principle of revelation, the principle of the Imago Dei, um, and that the drives from that, then then the game's over. Yeah, yeah. Now here's here's quite a potentially quite a big question from Guy Douglas. John, what would you think Hammond's critique would be of today's Western mainstream churches? Uh, the, the mainstream Western churches. That's a good question. I I don't know. I mean, which aspect of them? I mean, uh. Well, the, the thing that interests me is the extent to which we're prepared to give secularism a free pass. Yes, yes. It's talking about presuppositions. Everything that's going on in, in I suppose, in the way that the, like you and I have spoken about this, Kevin. Um, Christianity Today apologetics is reactive. Everything assumes that there is this secular world and that Christians are reacting to a secular world. Well. Haman is in the middle before the whole secular world is really getting underway. He's saying that there is no such thing. That the whole the whole idea of a secular space is a fiction. It's a it's a it's a political fiction. It was created, you know, supposedly because you know religious people are more violent than non-religious persons and so forth. I mean, it's such a complicated history there. But um, but Haman will not allow you know Christians that the, to to think. That oh yes, there is such thing as such a thing as pure reason, in the first place. Mm -hmm. There is there is no such thing as reason that we can all really agree on because reason is always already formed by thousands of different strands of traditions. Um, um, so I think I think modern Christians have embraced the no the modern notion that there is this this circle 
of reason and public space. And it's secular, it's pure, and then out, it's the public sphere. And then outside of that is all this, all these religious, all the religious people. But that's, he'd say that's nonsense. Um, there is no such pure secular space. It's a creation, it's a fiction. Um, I mean, and John Milbank, I think no, no one has really shown this more clearly than John Milbank. I think theology and social theory is just, you know, like required reading for everybody in England, you know. <laughs> um, you know, the, in, Modern sociology is, is, is just kind of a, a bad theology at the end of the day. Um, but anyway, that's a whole other subject. Um, yeah, it, it, it is. Um, okay, I've got one here from your cousin, actually, who has uh, ventured uh, to submit a question. Um, it's not a trick question, which you perhaps might have expected. He says, what, according to Hammond, might be the best way to commend or point to Christ in our postmodern context? Well, that's interesting because one of the chapters in at the end of your book is about Derrida, isn't it? Yes. And about Ham, the kind of answers that Hammond would have provided there. Yeah. So let me repeat the question. Um, mm -hmm. What, according to Hammond, might be the best way to commend or point to Christ in a postmodern context, which is kind of where we are? I mean, if we if we assume that you know the postmodernism is is the, it entails the belief that there is no longer any transparent universal rationality and that all persons have access to this one universal rationality and that what is left are the kind of uh, are is is are just a, a countless different narratives about reality and so forth that there's really nothing there's really no set, no basis in reason um, in something called reason per se that everything is a matter of interpretation everything is a matter of hermeneutics and so forth if we if we assume that that there is no universal rationality left to which people have access apart from faith, and that's kind of the postmodern condition, then Haman would say, well, it's time to start believing again. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, um, we're, we are not going to be, we cannot go back to the 18th century and try to reclaim a notion of reason about which everyone can agree because there is no such thing as some, you know, it, it is such, there's no such reason. Um, and, there, and there is no such reason in this respect, in as much as reason is divorced from the laws. Um, and so if there, the only way that reason can survive, in, and I'm kind of thinking with Haman here, is through faith. Um, I mean, Haman was not a fideist per se. He really wasn't, but he was, com he was combating what he saw to be an overblown rationalism that would, that, uh, this bubble would, would, would burst. And so we're living in a world right now in which that, the bubble of rationalism has burst. And that, that really just, the only thing that we can do now is go back to, to faith and en encourage people to, to go back to faith. And, and that will then maybe allow us to reassemble the pieces but I, I think that um, one way to think about this is, so, to me, it's extremely helpful, um, is uh, to take, say, the, the, the traditional Thomistic maxim here, but to revise it in a Hamanian way. Um, the traditional Thomistic maxim is that faith does not destroy reason, but presupposes reason and perfects reason. Faith presupposes reason and perfects it. But that's not, that, there's not enough, Huh, there's not enough Augustine in there, and there's not enough, we could say not enough Luther, and there's not enough Haman in there. Because reason, apart from faith, there is no sure foundation for reason apart from faith. And so in a postmodern context, in which we no longer believe in a transcendent reason, a logos, the, a second person of the Trinity, if people don't believe in that, and, and people don't believe in, in, in any kind of derivative notion of a universal reason, imminent to human, our own humanity, then we have to go back to faith in order to keep reason from committing theoretical suicide. So I think, I think we do, we are rational beings, but, our, but we have to support it with faith you know, um, in order to even be reasonable again. Because I think the world's falling apart because we're, We've lost even reason. 
you lose God first, then you lose reason, and then it's all over. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm being a little apocalyptic here. <laughs> So. No, I, 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 I think it's yes, you got thumbs up from Jason. <laughs> yes, I, I think there's a lot there to 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 reflect on. I've got a question here from Josh, and he's and and I think it's a, a, a valuable question because it's one of the things that Hay, Heyman works hard at. Um, did, did Heyman directly address Kant's distinction between the unknowable noumenal and the knowable phenomenal realms? And if so, what did he do with it? So how did he address this idea of what's not known and known? Yeah, so, I mean, Haman criticizes the, the, precisely that. I mean, the, you know, the, the phenomenon behind the phenomena, you have the noumena. I mean, with this, something that is thought that is like a big X, you don't know what it is, something in itself. But um, Haman thought that that made the world, that kind of in some ways enclosed us in a world about which we really don't know anything. Um, but the eyes of faith, through the eyes of faith, we kind of see that, the appearances of things are not just appearances. They're not just phenomena. They are, you know, phenomena. They are, they are like phonemes. They're, they're words. They're soundings of the logos. They're soundings of the, of the, uh, of the second person of the Trinity, and God communicating to us all the time. Um, so there is no noumena. That, that whatever is noumenal in Kant is, is for common the second person of the Trinity, through whom all things were made. So he over he. he for by faith, he just immediately overcomes that spurious distinction and sees the phenomena as com divine communication. So for him, you know, the phenomena are, are God speaking to us through, through created things, through our neighbor, through all sorts of circumstances. Um, God is communicating with us, um, Haman thinks. Um, and the eyes, so the eyes of faith see the whole world differently. Um, so, like in this respect, he also was appreciated by he Hegel. I, mean, I don't care for Hegel that much, but um, but he too thought Haman was a genius because Haman just did away with the thing in itself. Really. Um, um, there is no kind of unknown something back behind the phenomena because God, it's God who is who is communicating with us all the while. Um, I hope that helps just a little bit. I mean, there are wonderful quotes with, about this in Haman, but... Yeah. Uh, um, the, the question that Richard uh, Hilliard asked right at the beginning from me is, uh, with somebody like Haman, where would you even start reading? <laughs> where do you start? Um, uh, where would I be? I, I, would, I would begin at, um, with the London writings, but they're not available. Um, yeah, uh, not yet. Um, but I don't know. I mean, for, for me, I what I put in the book after enlightenment was to, was that was to me my anthology mm. in a way. Um, so I, to me, it's like the I don't I don't even go back to it's just terrible to say I don't really go back to Haman anymore because I feel like I I pulled out all my favorite nuggets, you know, uh, all I thought was best in it. And there's certainly more that you could find there. Mm. Um, but as far as beginning. Honestly, it's almost impossible to get anything out of it without outside of context. So I'd almost say I I don't I I don't want to say you one would have to read my book. I that would be an anti-Hamanian thing to say. <laughs> oh yes, you must read this book. <laughs> um, though, um, but uh, Byers' book is is good. I would Gwen Gwen Griffith Dixon uh, Gwen. Griffith Dixon's book, Haman's Relational Metacriticism, is is an excellent book. Uh, I mean, she's uh, in London. Um, uh, she used to teach at King's College. Um, so, I mean, she's, I mean, as far as uh, Haman experts in England, she's it. So you guys, uh, maybe you can invite her to okay. <laughs> come visit you guys. Uh, we've got an interesting question from um, uh, Seth. Um, and I think it's an important one because you've been talking about how Haman is uh, interacting with the Old Testament. And Seth says, why should we have faith in the Christian scriptures rather than, say, the Quran or any other religion if all we have is faith? Which faith? Does Haman have anything to help us there or is he simply not addressing that kind of issue? I mean, fat, you know, um, I mean, fat, and fascinatingly, I mean, Haman isn't a dialectical thinker, so he will he reads he can, I mean, he can he can draw on anything anything that he is good 
he can draw on. If he finds something good in the Quran, he can draw on it. But does he believe that it's fully inspired? I think it, most definitely not. Um, but, but if he finds something good in it, he can draw on it. But the question is the, the, the Seth raises, the, the excellent question is like the criterion. What's the criterion for judgment? How do you judge what is inspired and what isn't? Um, you know, there, I don't know what other criterion one could advance, although it's, it's kind of begging the question really, but the, the, the Holy Spirit. Um, and so by the Holy Spirit, one can recognize what is inspired and what isn't. Um, so kind of spiritual discernment um, in knowing what outside of, of outside of the walls of Christianity is acceptable and what isn't. Mm. Um, I mean, Haman himself, you know, um, can can uh, is happy to find good things in, in all sorts of pagan authors, um, but he but he refers all of it back to Christ. So what you I mean. I don't know offhand, I don't have a better answer than to say that Christ is the principle and the foundation um, and that everything else is analogically related to him. If it, if it somehow is analogous to what we find in Christ, then okay, maybe so. Um, but uh, to the extent that it conflicts with what we know about Christ, then it would, uh, would, would fall out of consideration. Um, I one comment I would add to that is one of the things that I drew out of your book was the fact that Hammond was a, of an extremely avaricious and wide reader, and he yeah. did read all the pagan writers, and he didn't dismiss them. Um, and he said that in there was in in what they were saying, often there was a kernel of truth that was pointing back to Christ. Um, yeah. In many ways, he was quite ecumenical, wasn't he? And it's he in was. a way we're a bit uncomfortable with these days, perhaps. I mean, so I, you know, of the of the principles, like, if, like two mites, if I want to say, what are the what does Haman leave us with? I mean, number one is the the devastating critique of of secular reason. I think, I I, I, mean, I think it's unanswerable, really. Um, and so I think here the, well, the wonderful thing first is that the Christians can be confident um, in the modern world, knowing that that you know the modern world is really built on nothing, um, nothing really at all. It's built, you know, built on a bunch of political fictions. Um, it's so rather than being built on the word of God, it's built on on on, on kind of kind of spurious, you know, um, kind of reasoning. The second thing, though, then is is really uh, kind of the, his his rehabilitation of the of the theological doctrine of the logos spermaticos that we were, you were getting it from Justin Martyr. Um, you know that, that we can find evidence of the of the of the workings of God's grace even among the pagans. We can find seeds of the logos even among the pagans. We can look at the example of a Socrates, and then we and we can find a kind of proto-Christian. Mm -hmm. you know? We can find wisdom, you know, speaking through all different places. Um, that God has not let, abandoned the pagans, so to speak. Um, you know, but that we have, but from within the scriptures, we have you know every reason to say that. All these things must refer to Christ, you know, who says it's all about me. You know, um, you know, so we could extrapolate from what he says about the scriptures. You know, the Torah, the prophets, they're about me. Well, we can say whatever wisdom there is outside of Christianity, he could we, he, we could say, well, that too ultimately refers to me. Um, so I think Haman is an analogical thinker in that respect. Christ is the primary analogate of all goodness, all truth, all beauty that we would find in the world and in, in the culture and, and, a, and even a secular film or something, if something's good or beautiful, whatever we can find that's, that's good and beautiful, you know, what ultimately we could validate, um, but its ultimate reference would be to, to Jesus himself. Thank you. Well, I think on that point, John, I would like to thank you as we begin to draw to a close. Um, that for me has been a wonderful experience, really inspiring. I hope for all the rest of you, it's given you a real taste of what it's like uh, to put yourself in uh, uh, Hammond's mind briefly uh, for one evening and to experience a man who was critiquing his culture as it happened um, uh, well in advance of his time. So thank you, John, uh, very much for that.